Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network with your host, Tom Navolis. It's just been another amazing week with all that has been going on and the, the reality that once again we can take and go into the reflections of the mirrors of history. Now, as we're getting ready to do that, one of the things that I wanted to remind you of is was last week, you know, I re-ran a program on honest money. And we're and in that and in the promo for that program, what I was communicating was the fact that there's so much that's going on in today's environment. And, you know, we, we lightly hear that terminology and that whole idea of, you know what, just follow the money. Just follow the money. It, that's nothing new. We know that all through mankind that uh, the basics of human and uh, humanity and human history uh, has that tie that we talk about that is related to either money or power. Uh, larger than that, if we look into it and if we go back to our Puritan Reformation roots in many ways, what we see is that, you know, that's basically one of uh, the, uh, you know, or a couple of the ideas that are wrapped into the Ten Commandments around uh, covetousness and greed and, you know, some of that. And so, you know, you can go back and look at those Ten Commandments for yourself because they are really the fundamental basis of, of uh, correcting opportunities in human nature. So our nature is that which I uh, would preferably have all the money, have all the power, and control the world. Well, I don't know. Maybe not all of us want to control the world. That's too big for me. Uh, but, you know, what it gets down to is that when we're looking at that, it comes to what is that honest money? Well, today I do want to mention again that uh, Liberty Works Radio Network is a listener-funded network, and I sure appreciate all of you who participate uh, with us and not only listening to what we have going on here at the network, but additionally you contribute to that. So thank you very much for any contributions that you're making to this effort. And please check it out on the website. You can find it there at uh, libertyworksradionetwork.com or lwrn.net. And, uh, you know, look over all the other hosts that are there and, and see uh, how this affects you in relationship to your desire to understand more about what's going on and uh, liberty and what does that mean. And I'm going to talk about that here in this segue to honest money. Because before we can understand money and its functionality within the context of our society, we have to understand something about society. In my promo uh, last week, the written promo out on Facebook and email promos, one of the things that I was talking about was a gentleman by the name of uh, Witherspoon. Witherspoon, Witherspoon. Where, where do you guys get that? What, what do you remember about Witherspoon? Well, John Witherspoon, uh, he was a Presbyterian minister. He was uh, from Scotland. He was raised in Scotland. His father was a minister. Uh, and he actually had his first church there. Uh, he was asked to come to Princeton and be the president of Princeton, and he actually declined the first time. So isn't that interesting? Uh, after that, he uh, took and continued to minister there. He was in that transitional period. He, he was still of the Scottish Reformation mind. But he was in that peer group where the transition that I talk about a lot in the other programs was happening between the Scottish Reformation, Puritanism, and all of that, and the Scottish Enlightenment. And, and within the throes of that initial time frame of the Scottish Enlightenment, what we had going on was that they understood those Reformation biblical concepts, but at the same time, they were kind of digressing a little bit into uh, what now is known as humanism. It wasn't to the extent that it was at that period, but it was, you know, just a little bit of that. But um, all in all, Witherspoon, he, he was just one solid guy, as we know. He eventually came over, and he became the president of Princeton. 
and some of the very interesting things about him is that he was a minister that was politically involved. Let me say that again with that space there to give you to think about it. He was a minister that was politically involved. He was not only involved in his local community. He was not only involved in taking in being very profound in, in what he uh, taught from the pulpit as well as in the classroom. But he was profound in the fact that he argued successfully a number of different points and positions during the First Continental Congress, the Second Continental Congress. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, John Witherspoon was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Amazing! You know, something that was real interesting about him is that when he would come to Congress, and when he was at the convention for the new constitution, he had no compunction whatsoever about wearing his ministerial robes. Whoa, wait a minute. So you got these guys sitting in Congress today, they're afraid to even necessarily talk about where they are within their faith-based environment, let alone... If someone was a minister to go into Congress today and wear his his ministerial robes, uh, maybe someone of, uh, uh, I don't want to get down that road too far just yet, uh, but you, you can get the hint uh, where I'm hesitating at the moment based on all of the current events that have been happening uh, over this last several years, and in particular what's been happening in, in, in Paris and San Bernardino, where my inference is in that regard. But taking that more specifically, what I wanted to take and wrap together for you now, and I'm going to repeat this in each one of the segments, is what is civil society? Witherspoon brought together a very excellent lecture on civil society. What is it? How does it function? Uh, what does it mean to us? Because you, you can't understand money you can't understand the function of honest money and how it should operate within a society if you don't even understand what that society looks like or how society is uh, contracted. What What is society? How does that come together? Witherspoon took and, and through his, as many of our founders, his studies in regards to ancient history as much as anything else in modern European history of that day, but the ancient history, he came to a number of conclusions that were predominant within the concept of our foundation. One of the other things is I get to this concept of civil society. Remember that uh, Witherspoon was a very strong influencer, and I'll just mention a couple of the names that, that may strike you. There was a young man by the name of Hamilton. Uh, Witherspoon influenced him, especially with his lectures and concepts on money, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, that became, Witherspoon had that influence. The other one that Witherspoon had significant influence into was none other than James Madison, the you know, qualified founder or writer of our Constitution, the one that brought it to bear in its most uh, complete fashion and order. And this was because this guy sat under, Madison sat under Witherspoon. Yeah, this guy, Madison, sat under Wind Witherspoon and heard these lectures. So I'm going to take you to the first concept so that you get that, that you can't talk about money and understand how it should function in America, which it's not functioning the way that it should, and grasp that only when you have that grasp and understanding of what civil society uh, was thought of at the time, not only of the formation of this country during the revolutionary period, but all the way through to the development of our present constitution. So with that, what I'd like to bring to you is uh, the uh, civil society, that lecture, and uh, here's what he was talking about. Civil society is distinguished from any domestic uh, in, uh, in a union of a number of families in uh, one state for their mutual benefit. 
Uh, we have uh, before affirmed that society always uh, supposes and expresses or implied a contract or an agreement. So let's define that uh, in its what this necessarily implies. So uh, first off, ladies and gentlemen, when we enter into society, what we are doing is we are actually contracting with one another. We become in agreement with one another. And I am going to infer here very specific. No, I'm not inferring. I'm going to tell you specifically. So when it comes to our founders' understanding of bringing immigrants into this country, It came from that very fundamental preface that it starts with is the argument being that you have to come into agreement as well as now you're contracting, you're having a contractual relationship with those that you enter into this social order with. So he brings it to start out with number one from the consent of every individual to live in and be a member of that society. So you're consenting to that. And this society already has its parameters. So you consent to be a member of it. Uh, number two is a consent uh, to some particular plan of government. So when you come into the civil society, you have to consent and say, this is the government that's in that society, and I am consenting to participate in that existing government. Three, a mutual agreement between the subjects and the rulers of subjugation on the one hand, of protection on the other. These are all implied in the union of every society, and they complete the whole. Now, as you start looking at that, that, that's the formation of what it means to come together within our basics of a society. Any objections that uh, may be raised against this are uh, easily uh, solved. Uh, It gives the example, through every individual has not given an actual consent, yet his determination to live within any society implies it. Again, If uh, he's asked, you know, how are the children a part of that? Well, it's simply by the fact that they're born into it and they're uh, given an umbrella around the privileges of it. But when they come of age, this privilege that is there for them, they now have to consent to. And not only that, they then have a duty to participate in the society within the context of that consent. So there is a lot here that we have to look at, not only as we in America are born as Americans and our responsibilities within the context of our society, but ladies and gentlemen, as we take and we look at foreigners coming into our society, what does that mean? That's why I always challenge you to go back and you look at what? You look at the oath that people are supposed to take during that period of naturalization. What does it mean? They reject everything else, and they look to a contractual and agreement with our society, with our government, with who we are as a people in America. Become an American, not anything else. Now, and, and, and you know what, maybe later I'll get into this whole thing because I think that the surveys that Trump and others are talking about, especially with uh, a number of different foreigners, not necessarily just one uh, group of people, uh, as we're talking about in the Muslims in particular, but as we start looking at other groups of people, what do they do? The, any immigrant, if they are not taking that oath of office and relinquishing every other association... They're not truly becoming American. They don't understand what that means. And that goes to the very fundamentals of what Witherspoon is talking about in becoming a part of a society in this regard. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting to that point again where I have to take a break. And I ask you to come back again in the next segment of Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right here on Liberty Works Radio Network. And as you can... You know what? Check out the Samuel Adams website uh, and the blog and and our Facebook and see what's going on. Uh, A lot of times we're a little behind on some things, but you know what? There's a lot there in the mirrors of history that are relevant to this very day. 
Looking forward to you coming back. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back again to Samuel Adams Returns. The Anti-Federalist got it right here on Liberty Works Radio Network with your host Tom Novolis in the second segment of what we're talking about today in relationship to honest money only from the conceptual understanding of what is a good and moral society. And we're taking a look at it from that perspective of John Witherspoon. And as I mentioned before, that uh, as we look at his lecture on civil society, we're, we're going to talk about it very succinctly in that he looks at it that it is a contract or an agreement that each and every one of us enters into when we participate in that society. So if anybody is coming into this country, the intent of the founders always has been, and that's what's written into it constitutionally, and that's what the intent was in every extended writing, is that that person enters into a agreement and contract with who we are as our society, as our form of government. And I'm being emphatic on that because there's no room for Sharia. There's no room for anything else. No other form of government except what is constitutionally established from our foundation. All right. Um, and, and, and just go back you know, to, again, his three very fundamentals is, is that, number one, uh, the consent of every individual to live in and be a member of that society is part of it. Two, a consent uh, to uh, some particular plan of government. And three, a mutual agreement between the subjects and the rulers uh, of subjugation on one hand. And at some point in time, do the people have a right to you know leave, freely leave that the, the society, remove themselves from it? And he contends that, yeah, in a time of peace... Uh, that they do, and you know they can go away. They can become expats if you want to to bring it from that perspective. But uh, his answer and his argument that when it comes to a time of conflict, where there's a time of war, that emigration at that time uh, may uh, be hindered. You can stop it, and not only emigration going out, but immigration also should be hindered and stopped during those time of war. And those that are in this country, they need to contribute their share in what is necessary for the common defense. That's really interesting when it comes to what does it mean to defend what we're doing and participate in it. Then he, con he also continues on that whatever form of government in any society, the members may divide it into two classes, the rulers and the ruled, the magistrates and the subjects. And the rights of the rulers may be divided into essential and accidental. The essential being such that uh, you know there a general must be uh, set in place for every society. The accidental is that the rulers uh, have some uh, you know uh, some sense of that society, but necessarily not all. Uh, essential rights of the rulers are what require most to be enumerated. See, he was talking about enumerated powers there. I wonder where Madison got that idea from. You think it might have been John Witherspoon that uh, as he was talking about this lecture, it could have had a very distinct impact on what Madison then looked at in the enumerated powers in the Constitution for our great society? I think it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that he writes about here is that uh, from other writers, he says that the that, that government is divided in, into uh, some kinds, that being uh, legislation, uh, taxation for the public expense, uh, the jurisdiction and administration of justice, and representation of the people. And that that's what uh, he was bringing as the very, very essentials. Uh, the lesser essential rights of the rulers are many, and uh, they're called less essentials because uh, they may be more varied than anything else, such as coining of money. Oh, gosh, here it comes in that that's coining of money, that that becomes part of what is honest money as we continue here. Uh, the uh, processing 
or the managing of public uh, uh, edifices, the conferring honors on officers. So these rights uh, then come to what are the rights of the subjects in a society, in a state, uh, are, cannot be enumerated. We have, and geez, again, Madison brings that out, both uh, in our Constitution, that all the re rights remain to the people. So you cannot enumerate our rights, only by which, as we know, under a constitutional form of government and in that contractual perspective, that we submit ourselves to different things, but uh, it, it can't be that our rights are ever, 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 ever taken away from us. Uh, we may allow them to be uh, reduced for any period of time, but then he talks later in government where we have a right when tyranny comes into place to stand up against it and, and what that means. But that's another point of the conversation. But anyway, the rights of the subjects or the rights of the citizens uh, you, you just can't enumerate them. They're, that's what it is. That um, they are all summed up in protection. That is to say, those who have surrendered part of their natural rights expect the strength of the public arm to defend and improve what remains. Gosh, I think that's very detailed in the preamble. That's very detailed uh, in the other sections of our Constitution, the expectation is that our natural rights, if we take and we surrender those into that society from a contractual agreement, we expect that the rest of it, all of those natural rights are protected by that government which becomes formed. So I think those are some you know key concepts that we have to understand that our founders established that. And it was this guy, John Witherspoon, a preacher of all people, that was talking about civil society in his lectures that influenced Madison Hamilton and a whole cadre of others that initially formed not only this nation, but uh, the various states uh, in the East Coast in those earliest days. Now, it, it happens, as he goes on, that often said that uh, government is carried on by rewards and punishment. And he gets into this whole thing about that, that that's you know, not particularly the way that you want to see things happen. That it needs to be designed in a basis on a rule of law. Um, and that the foundation of society is on that consent, and that perhaps it may be necessary to mention that there are some exceptions in particular to this whole idea uh, of what we were talking about in rewards and punishment. And he goes in to say that, number one, if, the, if it's said by some with apparent reason that uh, a, a few persons, if accidentally armed with power, may constrain a large ignorant rabble to submit to laws which will be for their own good, this, I would admit, in, is in some cases uh, where it's evident that you would want to have that type of uh, uh, rewards and punishment, but uh, to maintain and keep that disorder of the multitude in check. And where there is a moral certainty that they will afterwards be pleased with the, the violence done to them. So it comes into an understanding that if you've got a bunch of rabble-rouser out there and you're going to go in there and whack them with a stick and get them you know, straightened out, that that becomes acceptable to them, that, oh, okay, you, you did that to me, and oh, I'm all better off for it. But, in general, it is but a bad maxim that we may force people for their own good. What are we seeing in society today? What are we seeing out of America government today? We're getting all of these things, especially out of these various agencies. Oh, this is for your own good. This is for the good of the children. This is for the good of this. That's a bad maxim. That has nothing to do with the proper civil society based on what Madison understood from his professor, from his mentor. Gosh, what's that all about? He goes on to say, Winthrop does, all lovers of power will be disposed to think that even a violent use of it is good for the public. It's good for the public. Wow. So coercion, as we're seeing it through various departments in our federal government, think that it's good for the people. 
And yet, uh, here we go all the way back to John Winthrop saying, no, that's not. That's a bad maxim. And then secondly, he brings up this idea that uh, though people have actually uh, consented to any form of government, if they have been essentially deceived in the nature and operation of the laws, if they are found to be pernicious and destructive of the ends of the union, they may certainly break up the society, recall the obligation, and resettle the whole upon a better footing. Wow. Those are some of the things that uh, we were brought out even in the Declaration of Independence at the very beginning. Um, why was it that we separated uh, from uh, Great Britain? After all of those charges were laid out, in there. It all talks about a civil society has the right to disassociate itself, recall the obligations, and resettle the whole upon a better footing. The language used in our founding documents is very interesting when it comes to the lectures of the such of John Witherspoon and others like him. Uh, Samuel Adams had a lot of effect into that. Um, and others that were well, well, let's just say it, they either stood at the pulpit or they stood at the head of education that, remember, Princeton, Harvard, uh, all of those were really designed to uh, bring ministers to bear, as well as then uh, those that would know the law, as well as those that then would have other educated uh, necessities within the society. But I think it's imperative that we understand that as we're going to look later at what honest money is all about, that we have to understand these formations of government, that we have to understand that basic contractual relationship that we have, and that is no different. But then when you have government that is outside the context of what it should be, as we've just discussed right here, then what happens? What happens? You start to see despotism and tyranny come into place. And what we have then that comes into place is usurpation against these fundamentals. And when they become usurped, then it goes back to this idea of what he said earlier, is that those that are, that are power mongers, they're going to do that. Those that uh, have that desire to be overlords uh, will be the destruction uh, of our society in general. So we have to go into, he gets into a large discussion of the different forms of government, what they are all about, uh, just real quickly, a monarchy, or aristocracy, and democracy as the three primary forms of government. And then he talks about a lot of complexities uh, from defining each one of those in a very detailed format, and that most governments have, and especially what we see in our modern government, have some kind of blend or mix of that. Um, he brings to bear the I in intent that there's four things that seem to be re uh, required uh, in any system of government, and every form is uh, good in proportion as it uh, profits or attains them, or gets them put together. One being wisdom to plan proper measures for the public good. Wisdom. We need wisdom. Two is fidelity to have nothing but the public interest in view. Three is secrecy, expedition, and dispatch in carrying measures into execution. And four, unity and accord in that, that one branch of government may not impede or hinder the other branch, but at times, as we see in our constitutional form of government, there is a necessity to slow one branch down over the other. It's called checks and balances. He goes into the details of how, how all of those function together. Uh, he talks about democracy. But one of the things that really caught my attention is that if true, if the true notation of liberty is uh, uh, prevalent of law and order. This is the true definition of liberty, that it's prevalence of law and order and the security of individuals 
none of the simple forms are favorable to that. They're not favorable to liberty. So come on back again in the next segment of Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network, where liberty works for you. Thanks a lot for listening, and I can't wait till you come back into the next segment. Segment. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network. And yes, I am Tom Navolis, your host, and it is such a delight to have you with me here again. I just uh, am always excited to know that uh, folks are there wanting to peer into those mirrors of history to understand the parallels as we look through those many reflections of what was there from our founding fathers, those early writers, those early educators, those ministers that actually developed this nation and set the principles by which we should be operating. And, and not only that, what, what we have is that whole development of the core understanding of human nature. And uh, it, it's just really interesting to see what has occurred, what's transpired uh, over all these periods of time and, and inflected uh, itself and injected itself into uh, what we do, how we react as people. So one of the things that we were going to talk about was uh, honest money. And, and what, what goes on with that money? How do we take and uh, we look at that in regards to um, our, our history? And interestingly enough, what I brought up at the very beginning of the first segment was that it was the likes of uh, Hamilton that uh, introduced a, you know, a very different form of discussion around banking, monetary system, uh, than what uh, many originally thought should happen. And, you know, I always scratched my head, quite frankly, and trying to figure out where in the world did he get these ideas because uh, some of what he was taking and promoting and some of the things that, uh, you know, he originally, when you started looking at him and his history and where he came from, you know, many know that he was a bastard child, but then when he came to work uh, under uh, General Washington, he rose in the ranks to the extent that, uh, what, he he actually was the uh, primary officer and, and uh, the cannoneer at the uh, end of the Revolutionary Period, uh, who won uh, in so many ways what was built uh, in, in those uh, right around uh, the whole battlefield uh, in Yorktown to take and actually uh, get that all set up for a, a great victory. But um, I'm, I'm going, wow. So then as he further gets into his political life, I was very disappointed. Many of you heard me comment that uh, he was one of those people that wanted to see an extremely strong national government and that at convention he turned out to be the absolute radical because the full or the rest of the New York uh, delegates left and in fact Hamilton was only allowed to sign uh, the Constitution as a courtesy because the delegation had retired uh, before the, the final votes were taken on the Constitution, and that's why New York took so long to actually ratify the Constitution. But with that, we have Hamilton, who becomes the greatest uh, next to Madison, uh, the, the, the person that argued in the Federalist, or what became known as the Federalist Papers, for the Constitution. And so he was this almost a one-man band arguing in New York uh, pro-Constitution, when many others and the rest of the delegation said, wait a minute, this Constitution would turn into a tyrannical and, and despotic government at some period of time if there were not more... Uh, things introduced, like what ended up happening with a Bill of Rights, 
uh, into the document itself, into its meaning. And then, as the anti-federalists wrote, and you hear me say over and over in other programs, is that they, they really had it right. They knew the nature of man to the extent that we have the form of uh, federal government in particular that they well predicted. So with all of that said, what I wanted to get back to is that Hamilton and Madison's mentor and instructor was none other than whom? Oh, George Witherspoon, who we've been talking about in the last two segments. So where I was initially going to go was that Witherspoon, uh, when I started looking at what Hamilton was thinking about in regards to money, he wrote this phenomenal essay and I, I just have no time whatsoever to get into uh, the essay in its totality. But if you go to the writings of, uh, excuse me, if you go to the writings of John Witherspoon and you take a look at that, the first essay in the writings of John Witherspoon, Volume 9, is the essay on money as a medium of commerce with remarks on the advantage and disadvantage of paper admitted into general circulation. So it became very interesting, and, and he talks about in the very opening paragraphs this whole idea that, uh, you know, as the public intelligence, as it was learning about the, all of the different things that were happening uh, in the country, that uh, this idea to emit bills of credit uh, by the authority of the government and to make them as some measure of uh, at least or, or, or some in some cases a legal tender for debts already contracted. Now that was the real concentration of what Hamilton uh, was looking at and even back when this essay was written there were debts within the colonies and what would that happen in, in that 17 uh, 60s period, late 1768 and so on, there, there were actually not just recessions in the colonies, but there were depressions, especially in the northern colonies. So when you start taking a look at New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, uh, those colonies in, per in particular, you're seeing that it had, because of the Bank of England, who the Bank of England was no longer the national bank, but the Bank of England by that period of time was controlled and manipulated by international bankers and merchants. All right, You have to get that parallel in history and a clear understanding of that first. So if you really want, in essence, and, and, and in its practical functionality, the Bank of England at the time of the American Revolution was no different than the Federal Reserve is today. It's not federal and it's not a reserve. It's a conglomeration of international bankers and American bankers that dictate the monetary system. All right? Be clear on that. So was it same, so was it true of the Bank of England during the Revolutionary Period. So when this was being written and designed, it was coming then into each of the various states, the various uh, colonies, determining their own means of legal tender, which became a very great conflict uh, for that Bank of England and saying, what are those American colonies trying to do? So in establishing that. And then, as Hamilton was doing when he became the Secretary of the Treasury under Washington, was to propose uh, the Bank of America or the American banking system that included this other form of establishing legal tender for debt already in existence. Not where the legal tender didn't make sense for commodities, but for debt. So what we're seeing exactly today is that we have a system that is not by the government but by a private entity that in essence is taking and uh, developing a monetary system that is to not only secure what it transacts in commercial uh, transactions, I said that both ways, transact and transactions, but what happens in the commercial world, but also uh, under the idea of how do you relieve the debt? And so then there becomes inflation and deflation on a debt management basis. So 
as all of this argument got going, some of the things that I wanted to bring back was the idea that, uh, you know, it, it was designed and argued even as uh, some uh, local and, and larger political parties uh, in various states were arguing about this and proposing this idea of legal tender. So there were those that were embedded in that. You have to understand that in discussion in absolute what uh, Witherspoon was trying to accomplish was go back to first principles. Everything has to go back to first principles to gain an understanding. And the first place that he talks about, and he says, let us then begin by considering what gave rise to money and what is its nature and use. So then the rest of it goes many, many pages in developing that. But one of the first things that we started this whole program about was that as society, so he talks about society, and it has to be a civil society, as society increases, the uh, partition of employments is greatly diversified, but still the fruits of a well-directed industry or the things necessary and useful in life are what only can be called wealth. So the accumulation of money in and of itself is not wealth. It's just a means of exchange. Ladies and gentlemen, when we look around us, what I want to just kind of leave you with here in a little bit as we then jump back over to civil society for a minute, is the whole idea that to be wealthy, it's what do you have around you? What is it that is not being accumulated in the cash in your bank or the billions, millions, or hundreds of thousands of uh, means of exchange that you have? Because those dollars, in all actuality, uh, they could be uh, uh, salt. Uh, they could have been cattle. They could have been something other. And that's what he argues is what are those tangible assets that have meaning that then develop into wealth and then our personal happiness. So there's many intangibles that go with that as well. But the fact of it all goes back to what we were talking about and leaving off in that last segment is that when we look at the true notion of liberty, that it is its uh, prevalence of law and order and the security of individuals and none of uh, the simple forms are favorable in one form of government or other except for the idea that we need to have a complex form of government to make it all work. And that's what we have in what was intended in our constitutional system. And as many of you know, and I know I'm preaching to the choir in this, is that the means of understanding and managing our monetary system is the job of Congress. Setting the value is the job of Congress, not the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve Act, as many know better than myself, is just to the benefit of no different to the, than the Bank of England, those great international bankers. And it takes and it moves our society then based on how we're able to transact things in our lives personally as well as then into commerce. So when we look at that and we try to derive that honest money, you know, in summation what we need to do is look at what we have for an honest society. What, what do we have in a society that, number one, understands the complexities of the checks and balances? Uh, Witherspoon goes back and says, hence it appears that every good form of government must be complex so that the one principle may check the other. And that's what the Madison was trying to build in, was to bring this integrity into government. And so if the Congress and if government by virtue of what our contract, remember, I, I began this whole thing saying that it is a contractual agreement with the government that the people enter into to live in, and that's where I want to take it in this last minute and a half. Ladies and gentlemen, anybody that immigrates, that comes into this country, they must contract with our form of government. If they do not, there is no way that they can properly assimilate into this government. So you cannot have Sharia law. You cannot have a, a people that are going to be beholden to that 
and become part of the society. It is absolutely impossible. Our founders talk about it in many, many, many documents that I don't even have the time to get into uh, during this segment, nor from the other. I just tried to lay that groundwork for you. So when we say, or whomever says, to stop the immigration now, period, is not only to get a grip on who's coming in, but ladies and gentlemen, how are they truly assimilating into this nation, and what does it mean for the survival of America and our first principles as a civil society? Well, I have to thank you once again for joining me here at Liberty Works Radio Network, and I look forward to you coming back next week to hear what's happening at Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right. Right.